picked the wrong week to quit sniffing glue. some lingerie for your wife uh yes uh, 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 i'm not really experienced in this I, I mean don't get me wrong i mean i'm i'm experienced you know i don't want to come in here and look stupid <laughs> too late <laughs> yeah. yeah should have gotten our watch robert clayton dean was innocent freeze there times 10. we have reason to believe that mr zavitz may have passed sensitive materials to you uh, what kind of materials sensitive so let's get into his life you bugged it, Mr. Dean. Move to audio three. He was unsuspecting. Hey, hey, find the wrong house. Hello, oh, yeah. Eric. Mr. Dean. He was unaware. You are the only woman in the world for me. You and Janet Jackson. <laughs> Coming your way over. Now, what he doesn't know. I'd like to report a break in. Could kill him. Request immediate keyhole visual tasking, maximum resolution. He's on your six o'clock. You have something they want. Two targets, rooftop. I don't have anything. Maybe you do and you don't know it. You're a threat now. To whom? Everyone you know. Targets on the move. A name, a phone number. No, nothing. He didn't give me anything. You know how many federal agents you had following you? Stay exactly where you are. I want to use every means possible to get what we need. From Jerry Bruckheimer. Get the cat. What's the cat's name? Babe. Producer of The Rock. Come here, baby. <laughs> baby, come, come. Come here. A film by Tony Scott. Target is on 21. Director of Crimson Tide. Is this about me? 20. Do they know me? 19. Who is that? 18. He jumped to 17. Do they know me? I don't know what you're talking about. Will Smith. You're one of them, aren't you? Former conspirer. Switch it, Tony. Switch it. Gene Hackman. This man, this is our problem. You live in another day, I'll be very impressed. It's not paranoia when they're really after you. Don't stop it now! Enemy of the state. What the hell is happening? I blew up the building. Why? Because you made a phone call! <laughs> Well, this is the thing, though. Like, this is how you know how how dedicated people are to the cause that they keep te telling people, or the you know the the, the populace, uh, how dedicated they are to the you know the root the root core thing they stand for is when the money stops. See how much they're banging on about it, because a lot of these guys go very quiet when the money stops. Uh, Alex Jones is one of them. He's went right to the. He's went even further. To the right. He is very passionate about. Oh, speaking of which, have you watched the Pizzagate Massacre that came out uh, about a year ago, maybe? No, no, I have not. It is Who probably did that? Is that exactly a... what you're picturing. A small film production out of Austin, Texas. Uh huh. Um, I don't re I, I I heard about it because somebody said, oh, you've probably watched this, huh? And I was like, actually, no, I haven't. And it's, um, it was, you know, directed, edited, all this other, sh you know, half the people that were behind the camera were on the camera. But it's mm -hmm. like a, I don't want to say, I, I think the box art missells it a little bit, but not that much. But uh -huh. so basically it's, it came out in 2020. Uh, they call it a dark social satire. Uh, but the, it's conspiracy theorists and there's Pizzagate and there's a journalist that wants to work for like a woman Alex Jones type. <laughs> <All right. laughs> she, she goes on a road trip with a militia guy who's kind of, mm -hmm. you know, right-ish, libertarian-ish type guy. Uh, they're going across country to investigate the pizza place, basically. It's a different pizza place, but... Uh, it's, I think you can rent it on YouTube or 
iTunes for something oh, like that. I'm, I'm 100% checking it out now. 100% checking it out. So. Okay. Uh, I, I checked it out and I was, you know, it wasn't exactly what I expected, but I hate when I expect something before I see a movie anyway. And I was yep. happy with it. You should check out, and uh, let me get the name of this from my letterbox because I have watched it, and a lot of people have not watched it because they keep muddling up with the other. So there's a movie called Dash Cam. Okay. Right. Now, it's not to be confused with Dash Cam, direct, the horror movie directed by the the guy that made um, the, the Zoom-based Shudder horror movie from two years ago was it host hosts oh okay what was that uh rob's rob savage or something like that yeah like that don't don't yeah don't get my he released a movie called dash cam last year but there's also an american movie called dash cam that was released last year by a guy called christian nielsen um and it is be you'd fucking love it Right, it's all what we're talking about just now. It's the found footage version of what we're talking about right now. It's a guy who is, everyone's working from home and they're doing a report on the former district attorney, because we're using district attorney again. <laughs> former district attorney ha- died under weird circumstances. By the way, district attorney played by Larry Fesden. Just leaving it there. Um, oh, I know. Yeah, so you can imagine he dies. Because um, he dies in every movie. But so... Um, they're doing a new story about how he was he was pulled over for a DUI and he got in a gunfight with a police officer. And um, the report's all done, but this guy, the, the main guy that's in the movie, played by uh, Eric Talbuck, uh, is piecing together a new story using, like, iMovie or whatever for, for the, the company so it goes out. And he's waiting for the dash cam footage and it gets sent to him, but he gets sent the wrong thing. So, like, the the you assume the FBI or CIA phone him as soon as you received it to say, we think we've sent you the wrong thing. We need you to delete it off your computer and tell us that you haven't watched it. And he's like, oh, I haven't watched it. I yeah, definitely delete it. And he, start wa- he starts watching it, and it starts to build a, a greater conspiracy. Ooh. And I'll say no more about it. Short movie. It's about an hour and 25 minutes. It's called Dash Cam. Came out last year in the States. And it is a good old fashioned kind of combination found footage, combination, you know, proper shot movie. Just really, really, really good thriller in the vein of The Conspiracy. So. Ooh-hoo-hoo. All right. Yeah. Directed I thought by it was Christian great. So. Nilsson. Nielsen, yeah. Nielsen. So, ch- right. highly recommend because no one's fucking talking about it, and it's kind of great. So, all right, gonna have to check it out. In between VD Clinic movie things, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in between all the other things I have to do, <laughs> you know, the we're life doing of the a- new Candyman is- next month or this month. Did it- Dude, it's the, I've said it before and I'll say it again. The bane of existence of being a podcaster is everyone that listens to you thinks you just get to watch whatever the fuck you want. And actually, in reality, it's it's stuff that you enjoy, but it's never the stuff that you want to watch. <laughs> it's You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's stuff like, like watching a new Candyman, that's a great time. You're going to have a great time doing it. Chances are when you actually, when that rolls around, you probably won't want to watch the new Candyman. You want to watch something else, but that goes in the back burner every watch Dash single, every single fucking time. And that is that is the world of the podcaster, and people don't know. And this is why so many podcasts start, get about four episodes in, realize they're not having fun anymore, and stop because you're never doing what you want to do. You're doing what people think you want to do. <laughs> That is a perfect way to say it. It's true. I like. I've I've been through many many years of it now. I'm almost. I'm like. I'm. What well, next year will be my tenth year doing this? Holy shit! Which is weird. <laughs> like just in general, like next August. So I'm what about uh? As we stand there, about a year and a half away from uh, from hitting my. <laughs> like 10 year anniversary of podcast yeah and it, did, it feels weird <laughs> it feels weird to even fucking say it and at the same time I'm like that 
I legitimately could have learned fully a foreign language or how to play the guitar by now. Transferable skills with the time that I spent. But, you could become the next yeah, Mary Call just... with all of your sound design <laughs> uh, and microphone purchases. Uh, I think you mean Edward Lyle because this is Enemy of the State. Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> totally, oh. totally not the same character, but also totally the same character. <laughs> Yes. Sadly, when I watched um, this week, uh, I watched, um, I don't know if you're recording, but this will be an interesting story. Uh, this week, I watched, sat down um, and uh, put on, which is always a great time, and also double bills really, really well with the conversation. Uh, I watched Chinatown by the Ooh. now, and I've seen now, I mean, kind of for the last, what, 40 years, much maligned director Roman Polanski. Um, we'll see, we'll see, contra- well, it's not even controversial, suspect, um, unsafe to be a friend to uh, Roman Polanski. And uh, I sit there watching that movie, and there's a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of parallels between, you know, the conversation and uh, Chinatown, but uh, what a lot of people don't know out there is that their like enemy of the state is the unofficial kind of spiritual sequel to the conversation and that edward lyle as a character played by gene hackman is you know he's very similar and the way he operates the clothes he wears and his attitude to one mr harry coyle from the the conversation but jack nicholson did actually reprise the role of his character from Chinatown in a movie called Two Jakes, which came out very early in the 90s and bombed colossally. And it's weird that because Chinatown is arguably the best film noir slash neo noir movie ever fucking made. And Two Jakes is okay. <laughs> it's just one of those. It's an all right watch, and Nicholson obviously is having a ball doing it, but the movie itself kind of plain. And it's interesting I say that because the conversation, arguably one of the best thrillers ever made, and in the state from 1998, is fine. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's an entertaining things. little romp that updates a lot of the conversation into the modern realm, kind of. Yeah, Robin 90s, Will Smith, Big Willie style. Yeah, it's pre um, Patriot Act, which was about three <laughs> years later. But yeah, which in itself it... is, <laughs> which in itself is fucking scary. I mean, like this movie preempts a shitload of things that happen within three years. Eerily so, as if it hadn't been a slow march towards that. Even going back <laughs> to Richard Nixon. And yeah. because his administration was one of the first ones that talked about getting rid of attorney pl- client privilege and talked about. I mean, about... why would you need it? Why would you need it there? <laughs> yeah. Why do you need to talk about anything with your attorney that can't be shared with everyone, including the government? I mean, you've got something to hide. Why should you have privacy with your doctor? And I think they were yeah. even talking about uh, clergy. Being able to call clergy. Yep. And uh, I can you tell I recently read a, a book? Um. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 it, makes me, it makes me wonder if things like, I don't know, the Masons were in there or Skull and Bones or were these organizations named as well? Or was it just the ones that average people go to? In in well in the recent book the the big the big one was uh, the militarization of police in America, so it was yeah. mostly just just that you know things that get floated like using one warrant to search an entire block, uh, things they like call that. this. <laughs> I, I am a big fan of, and I don't know why I started doing this, but in the last like two years, I've become a huge fan of wrestling podcasts. And I'll be honest, I'll be like with your listeners, I'll be honest, I was never the biggest fan. Like I watched WCW and I watched WWF at the time. Um, I was into the whole kind of Monday Night Wars and it was a lot of fun and all the rest. But I was never like a huge fan, but I love podcasts where people relive these things. Specifically, if anyone wants them, like Jim Cornette 
in the Cornet Experience podcast is some of the funniest shit you'll ever hear because he just hates everything. And there's a part of me that loves people that just hate fucking everything. Um, but I listened to a lot of that, and they call what you just said that I, what you just place it as a is how they used to write wrestling stories, which would someone would start by saying, "Well, what if we did this?" And then everyone <laughs> would say, "Well, either that's a stupid idea, or it's a great idea, or it needs some refinement." So basically, you're saying like clergy, you're saying attorney-client privilege, you're saying police state. It kind of feels like someone's sitting in a room, a policy-making room, and they're like, well, "What if?" attorney client privilege didn't exist anymore and people are like oh kind of like that because they say things that we can't hear yeah and what about maybe if we did it with our doctor as well so that's not you know plant a bug in there and we can hear things would everyone be all right with that everyone seems okay with that do we think the american people will go for it we don't think they will right that makes things difficult but not impossible gotta work. and that's kind of where you are yeah patriot Act. Yeah. all you have to do is bring down three buildings and uh, people will sign on to anything, including illegal wars in Iraq. <laughs> I feel we're jumping, we're jumping the gun here. That's why we split it into two separate episodes. Because <laughs> <laughs> the first one was the loving. This is the conversation at the docks, as the great Bill <laughs> Hicks would say. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think this movie was how we came up with the idea of going back to the tag team of the conversation followed by the weaker uh, enemy of the state. You are right, because I watched this over, I watched this towards the end of last year, because it's on Disney Plus, uh, as Is a it? lot of movies are now. Yeah, it's on Disney Plus because Fox put it out, so, uh, and like that means they can do whatever the fuck they want. So Disney Plus have uh, stars where they throw all their stuff out on which is stuff that kids shouldn't be watching. And I think I, I I was watching it. I don't know what made me watch it. I was very drunk. <laughs> uh, that was probably where it started. And uh, I was trying to pick something on Disney Plus because we pay for it, but I never fucking use it. Kid uses it and the wife uses it, but I never use it. Although Conan's on it. And that I watched it over Christmas and I was like, oh, Conan, yes. And I was like, oh, they've got loads of things like another stakeout and... Stake out. Uh, I need to, I need to, like, and then Mark for Death with Steven Seagal, where he was still thin. Um, and it has, like, that time period where, like, it's about the Predator 2 time period where, like, the biggest problem in America was Rastafarian gang lords, which was the thing for a while in all your movies, which makes me laugh, you know, with a, about the one who'll be doing all the killings, I am. And you're like, this is just bad like just fucking terrible but um, but i I remember flipping through and seeing enemy in the state and i remember you're right i I posted the fucking actors list of people that are in this movie and it blew my mind and i'd seen enemy in the state before a couple of times but i hadn't watched it in several years but just to kind of recap here will smith gene hackman John Voight, Lisa Bennett, Regina King, and then let's see, Jake Busey and Scott Can and Jason Lee and Gabriel Byrne. And oh yeah, Jack fucking Black and Jamie Kennedy. And the list just was like, <laughs> I was watching it going, like, the cast listening to this is fucking nuts because it's the it's the kind of new wave of slasher movies where you have all these people that are going to essentially have huge careers in the next decade like your Jamie Kennedy's your Jack Black's your Jason Lee's your Gabriel Burns so your great. Scott Can who like, obviously made a fucking shitload of money off those ocean movies Jake Busey all those ones and then on the flip side you're kind of well to do like staples of your Lisa Burnett's who was like well into her career and made the a lot of money off that since but your gene hackman's who's fucking hollywood royalty john voight who's hollywood royalty and they're like the look they're the button forces they're your kind of your antagonist and protagonist here and will smith who was the upcoming guy at the time like will smith and something that's going to make all the money um and he, you put tony scott as the director and i'm sitting watching this going 
like I, I, I just, I was blown away because I, I remembered Will Smith, I remembered Gene Hackman, I remember John Voight, but watch it when that list of people come out at the beginning, and as you're watching the movie, I was like, the cast in this fucking nuts is like just like anyone, everyone, like and like and just get them all in in this movie, and yeah, and I, I was talking about it, and then we mentioned. It would be an interesting one to cover. And then I think I mentioned if we we're doing it, we should do like the the grand puba, so so to speak, of this genre, which was a conversation. Um anyway, state is what you get if you update well, we talked about in the previous episode about the tech that existed then and how people just like like assume certain things. Anyway, the state is now twenty-four years old. And the tech they're talking about back then is all but redundant, but the the messaging is very much updated in that this is just what the government does. And like you mentioned, it's a couple of years ahead of the Patriot Act, but in this movie, essentially what they're trying to get across the line is the Patriot Act. It's a quasi version of it. Um and what you realise is, like, the Patriot Act is great in that it, it legally provides, that, when I say great, I mean I'm against it, but it legally provides the government an umbrella which covers them. But what I believe and what this movie shows is that they don't necessarily need that umbrella if they want to do something. They just do it anyway. Yeah, they just have to cover their asses a little bit more diligently mm. if if possible and it's yeah it is the slow the slow march it's the slow march of the surveillance state and they're <laughs> they're turning the, the, the goddamn frogs key it doesn't have to be on a disc now it's in the cloud <laughs> it's, it's, it's that meme of grandpa simpson saying old man yells at cloud <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I love, which I love, which was clearly not used for that, but should be used for everything about that now. Um, but yeah, so this movie, to be honest, this movie is, well, well, let's be honest, this movie is nowhere near as good as the conversation. However, if you were going to remake the conversation in 1998, just before, I don't know, like The Matrix was released, this is how you would do it. I mean, this is the idea of, like, essentially attorneys now paying private investigators to collect information, to use, to strong arm people to do what they want. Like, I, I love that, like, the, 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 the general perception of this movie is Will Smith's a good guy. Will Smith is not a good guy in this movie. Will Smith is the attorney who, yes, is standing up for the little man, but he's doing it using legal means. <laughs> like, the, the beauty of this movie is the, the greyness that exists without it. There's not, there's not one person in this movie out with Regina King, who plays Will Smith's wife, who's fucking amazing. There's not one innocent character in this out with that. Like, they're all shades of grey. Uh, some are more towards the black side, uh, and some are more towards maybe the lighter side, but they're all... Like, everyone in this movie is a bad character. Um, Will Smith, I like to cover our, our kind of synopsis in three parts like we did in the previous one. Uh, this one has uh, essentially a hit that's carried out by John Voight, who's very high in the CIA. He's kind of en route to becoming the full director of the entire organisation. And you know what happens after that, President? Because look at, like, George Bush, Sr. That's what happens. You're in charge of the CIA. One minute you blink and you're in the office and then you don't get re-elected because you do that stupid, read my lips. No, you taxes, and then you release taxes. You ask for more taxes, and then people don't vote you in because the guy that you're running against plays the saxophone and lays pipe like no other man on the planet. Um, Bill, Bill Clinton shagged a lot, uh, but you know, see, like you have like John Voight's, he's that guy, and he kills the main opposition to his bill 
to pass like this Patriot Act thing. Uh, but he does it without doing his due diligence, Dern, which is never a great idea. And he's captured by, of all things, a fucking bird camera across the bay. Um, and that captured footage gets planted in the bag of uh, Robert Clayton Dean, played by Will Smith, who's shopping for underwear. Very kind of um, Christmas vacation-esque. You know, <laughs> it's, it's like, you know what I mean? It's kind of one of those, you know, uh, a, a nipple. I mean, did I see nipple? <laughs> you know, it's kind of that it's moment. Snippy out. <laughs> snippy out. I, I, did I see nipple? <laughs> You know, it's kind of as that is one of those moments. Although Big Willie still handles it much more smoothly, um, but like drops the the evidence in Will Smith's bag, and the 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 people at the CIA, the crack team of people who are Jack Black, which makes me this is the, like I forget about this. Like when Jack Black first made our screens, we, we all know him now as the School of Rock guy in the Pick of Destiny. I think a lot of people forget that Jack Black when he first started in Hollywood, it was thrillers and horrors. So it's this movie, it's the Jackal with Bruce Willis. It's <laughs> fucking absolutely horrible. I know what you did last summer too when he plays a Rastafarian. Um, oh, and right. it's bad he is, yeah, he's in that one, he's terrible but it's all this time period, it's all 98 that's the roles he was playing before he did School of Rock um, but yeah, so like Jason Lee is the guy who essentially gets the thing, puts it in Will Smith's bag, and then the government ruin his life by doing all the things that the government have access to to ruin your life, which is remove credit cards, like like make make you a pariah, release false news stories, and like a, a narrative that, that all the news organisations are run with, and um, the the information that Will Smith's been getting to represent a union against the mob. Yeah, let that sink in. Has come from uh, Lisa Bonnet, who plays Rachel F. Banks, a guy who uh, a woman who he used to have sex with, but she is like the panhandler for Edward Lyle, a.k.a. Gene Hackman, a.k.a. same character from the conversation. And then they meet together and then they go on the run and yeah, it's the government basically trying to destroy the reputation of Will Smith using all this different technology and then Gene Hackman helps Will Smith reverse that and put it back on the government, which could not possibly happen now. That is basically the movie, but where the conversation is smoky jazz rooms, a little bit of saxophone, someone sitting down twiddling dials and knobs trying to get things. This is the, how you do this in 1998, which is car chases, buildings exploding, like driving a cycle, a bicycle on the wrong side of the road, uh, murder, death. Uh, you know, rooms full of people typing things into computers and like the satellite images which zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. The like, remote control I... satellites even. It's like, okay, I need it. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> as if this exi- This did not, I, I, much as I want to give credit to tech back then, did not exist in 98. But, you know, like, it's just all that shit. So it's like the, it's the hyper, it's like if you wanted to, it's like if someone sat down and said, I wanted to do the Brundlefly version of the conversation in the movie <laughs> Hackers. <laughs> anyway, the state is that movie, right? But we want, we want, it's just, it's the thing about it though is, it's, it's not a great movie, it's not a terrible movie, it's entertaining as fuck though. It's more popular. You know what I mean? Like, it's well, 100%. <laughs> this is like, I can't imagine like millions of people go to the cinema to see the conversation I know for a fact millions of people went to the cinema to see Enemy of the State yeah I mean it, it ticks the boxes, it delivers what it needs to, Hackman is fucking like once again Hackman is great in this John Voight is good like the the, the, the role that you want in your, your, your movie of Gene Hackman and John Voight are fucking brilliant in this one, Will Smith it's kind of great in this movie. I, I, I'm not a big Will Smith fan, but I think he's excellent in this one. And then all the supporting characters are fucking awesome. Like Jake Busey and Scott Can as the the, 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 the kind of the, the guys that are signed on to be like, essentially the I, I I don't know what you call those like assassins essentially the the, the strike team are are fucking awesome. Uh, Jason Lee's great 
playing Jason Lee and everything that Jason Lee's ever done. Uh, Gabriel Byrne, who's in this for a blink and you will miss it role, is fucking great as well. Jack Black and Jamie Kennedy is the you know the, the geeks from the computers. It's like the casting across the board is fucking great. Like the score is awesome, and you have a guy who is like a pedigree. Tony Scott has a pedigree of doing action thrillers. That's his. That's his thing. You know, up until he committed suicide, that's what he did. And like, if you look at his, you look at his filmography, um, he did it really, really well. I mean, like, like this is a guy who went on from doing, like. <laughs> arty horror movies like The Hunger through things like Top Gun, True Romance, The Fan, Enemy of the State, Spy Game, Man on Fire, which is a personal favourite of mine, Domino, which I love but I really shouldn't. Oh, the, uh, the remake Knightley of the movie? Oh, I really, I like, oh, yeah, did. I really like that movie and I shouldn't. Which is oh, like, why? Hello. Why shouldn't you? Yeah, but it's, it's hard to be like that. Hello. My name's Domino Harvey. <laughs> and you're like, really? And she's like, and I'm a crack assassin. And you're like, no, you're not. You're a model. Don't do this, Kira Knightley. Um, I'd like, one day, if, like, I don't think you'll ever be able to swing Domino into your, <laughs> into the corn. Well, you did Bubble Boy. If you ever want to do Domino, I will 100% come back and do That is a guilty, guilty, guilty fucking pleasure of mine. Um, easily tied to the bail system in America I, like, I love you and don't ever change right <laughs> so we, we will do that but yeah like like Tony Scott is a action thriller director he made his money off doing action thrillers and guess what he's fucking great at doing them right and so you have him and it's all that kinetic energy which the conversation doesn't have and it's the same sort of idea and the same sort of setup. And it's still talking about big government and its intrusion. All that stuff that, you know, like, like see, whenever you hear, like, a, a liberal who isn't actually... See, when you hear, like, ever... A libertarian, sorry. See, if you ever hear a libertarian talk... Libertarians are my favourite people in the world. Because, in principle, if the world was a utopian society, what libertarians espouse makes 100% sense, Right? Like they are, like they claim they're not, but they're one hundred percent idealists, right? Yeah. No, no, no. I'm I'm talking about you know, shrinking the government and like less taxes, and like that. Yeah, like you're. I hear what you're saying, but you're an idealist, right? Like you, you're like it's pie in the sky stuff because nothing. Like and we've spoken about this before with Smoke, who's not here to defend himself. So fuck you, Smoke. Um, <laughs> but like libertarians are the, the exact example of someone who like, does not have a grasp on how the world works or how services work or how government actually works. Like, well, I shouldn't be paying taxes. Well, who pays the police? Uh, uh, well, someone will pay the police, but how, how do we get the money? Uh, well, people can chip in like a tax. I don't know. <laughs> is, is that kind of what you're saying? Oh no, no, we can't do the formal thing, right? So who puts it in the burning building then? Who pays? Who pays for public services? Oh, public services should be paid by corporations, all right? Because they have a great track record. Yeah, they always do. So that that'll work. They always, always. They don't have a boardroom, Dern, with shareholders wanting their investment back plus like ten over the top of it. They don't want that. They, they have. The average Joe, like this is this is where it all fucking falls apart, and this is why it's idealism. Because in a world where money doesn't have any importance anymore, libertarianism completely works, hundred percent. And it's it's probably what I would vote for every single time. The idea of you keep your nose at about my business, I keep my nose at your business. I like that. The introvert in me loves that. But guess what? People like have to do jobs. I have to like maintain a degree of red tape which needs to exist. And guess what? Those need to be paid from the public, which means taxes, because there's no way to do it. So that's where it all fucking falls apart. Like a paper mache pig that someone's pissed on <laughs> and becomes just wet tissue on the ground that no one wants to touch. And that's the problem with it, right? So th these are these are these kind of these broad spectrum, these 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 overarching opinions. What anyway the state is doing, this is how I'll link it back to the movie, because I'm a pro. Uh, what anyway the state is doing is basically it's taking the the position of should government be able to, with the best intentions at its core, 
monitor its civilians to stop bad things happening before they happen, i.e. minority report? Or should people be afforded the rights to have their privacy to talk about, joke about, or say whatever they want without fear of the government clamping down on them for the wrong reasons? And the grey area that exists between where we all want scenario B, but realistically we also want scenario A. We want to know if terrorists are going to do something, we want to know that the government know who they are, can apprehend them and stop them from doing their acts. But at the same time, we don't want to lose that at the cost of the freedoms that we're afforded as citizens. And you will never, ever get a happy medium on that. So horrible things will always happen. We'll always complain. How did these things get so far? The authorities that are used to mean, you know, essentially police these things will say we need more powers. And we're like, well, they should totally have those powers. And then a bill will be put forward and then we'll realise how much it actually impacts on our freedoms and then we'll fight against it. That's the enemy of the state in a nutshell. Except it has a bitchin' 1998 score. It has big Willie style going, getting jiggy with it. Nah, 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 nah. Uh, uh, and it's, it's kind of handled in a very flashy Hollywood sort of way. Whereas the conversation really relies on those conversations internally and with your family and with your politicians and makes you think like you walk out of enemy of the state not thinking about anything and that's the big that's the, that's the dividing line between the two movies is one is thought provoking and the other one is like you said before popcorn munching yep. which is not thought provoking unless you're counting calories and which it <laughs> is then I, th I think if you average it out i think i saw somewhere that i think the average shot is like two and a half seconds Oh god, like so many fast cuts. So many fast like the cuts in this movie are fucking written. It has this late nineties, early two thousands thing about, you know, we're gonna go to the satellite image and then it's just like snapshot, snapshot, and then zoom, 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 zoom. And everything they're doing is zoom, 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 and camera angles are moving and the music cut like it's, it's just it's so busy. It, like you talked about the cinematography for the conversation, which to me is Oscar worthy. And then you talk about the cinematography for, and let's find out who did the fucking cinematography for our enemy the state, because this could be funny. Uh, cinematography was done by Dan Mindel. Dan Mindel has done, <laughs> let's see how many of these have won an Oscar. Um, he did Enemy of the State. He did Spy Game, which is shot exactly like this, actually. Uh, he did The Skeleton Key, which is a movie I love, but it moves very, very quickly. He did Domino. So, oh, there you go. Hello, my name is Domino <laughs> Harvey. Um, Mission Impossible 3, the Star Trek reboot, John Carter of Mars, Star Trek Into Darkness, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens, Zoolander 2, Pacific Rim Uprising, and Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. I would argue with you that this guy does flashy, fast-paced action cut cinema. That would be a good guess. And it, it, it yeah. kind of back and forth as since the previous episode exists definitely in our timeline. Oh, we, yeah, we 100% recorded that just before we started doing this. So it, it, it breaks down to all those things. Like in the conversation, every drawer you open in Gene Hackman's little chain link fenced office mm -hmm. has the thing that you need in there. And then. Yeah. I'm sure Will Smith wasn't carrying a full shopping bag. I'm sure, <laughs> you know, all the, all these little just like, oh, well, we don't, we don't need that detail because we're cutting to the next scene, cutting to the next, cutting to the next part. He's so clueless throughout this movie. Even by the end of this movie, he's like, the, here's the difference in these two movies. At the end of the conversation, Gene Hackman is played over the phone, a recording of him within his apartment and is fucking terrified to the point that he tears his apartment apart. At the end of Enemy of the State, Will Smith realises that Gene Hackman has planted a camera in his house and he fucking smiles at it. Ugh. You know, like that's, that to me is the big story. And it's not even just like a bad film. And to me, actually, it's the most honest statement that both those movies can make about the generational gap 
is in 74, the idea of someone listening to you is fucking terrifying. The idea of someone filming you in 98, not so much. Like if they did a third instalment of this in 2022, the idea of like you, like your online presence being a thing that just like a corporation could just hire like that, not a big deal anymore. And that's that's how much we jump. Um, it's, it's, it's like it, like on some level it's scary, and on the other one it's inevitable. I think the idea of what we consider privacy is. Is all but gone and will definitely be gone in the next fifteen years. Like I think the lives we led leave or, or, or live. I don't think leave. I think the lives that we try and leave. Um, I think the just the, the general consensus will be that it is a hundred percent acceptable and fine for corporations to know exactly what you're doing whenever you're doing it, and people might not necessarily be 100% comfortable with it, but that will just be the status quo and the norm. Because you have a generation of people that have grown up with it. Um, and that's how you that's how you get change. Like, when people moan about, like, oh, you know, it's like the American thing about, like, the, the governments, you, the systems you have of government just now. And, like, there's a lot of outcry, obviously, against the, the red side, against the blue side. 20 years from now, there really isn't going to be a red side. Aging out, and that's that. That's why the red side is is fighting so dirty and so hard right now. Is that they will have the data, they'll have the projections, and they'll know that in twenty years' time, it's not really a thing anymore. So they need to do everything in their power to stack the 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 deck in favour of them, because if you look at the raw data, um, like younger people tend to be more blue and they tend to hold those values longer whereas in the past people that were stereotypically blue became more red over time because you fear more things more intrusion the older you get uh, but that's changing technology makes that difference so that's why they're clambering that way um, but there's a result of that. There's an effect of, of that that comes with it, and that is just the reliance on technology and the normalising of things that an older generation see as being breaches of civil liberty. Um, so you have that to contend with as, as well. So it's change. It's never bad change. Like people see me, like one of my favourite things, uh, and I'm not saying that our friend in our chat who usually is joining me is bought into this. The idea that every world government, like every country's government, where whether they're right or left, or dictatorship or democracy, have all conspired together to make COVID a thing to control the population is fucking laughable. <laughs> right. Like governments governments can't agree on anything. You know, like they, can, they can't even get like infrastructure contracts delivered on time on budget. So the idea that there's a global conspiracy of that is fucking laughable. Uh, it's, it's perpetrated by people that just don't understand how inept governments actually are. Which is the irony because that's what libertarians want. Libertarians want like ineffective governments. Guess what? You have that by proxy without voting libertarian. That is literally what you have. It's completely fallible. It's completely full of people that are like open to corruption and just shitty at their jobs. They have ideas that never turn out and, you know, lobbyists that don't want them to do the things they want. So guess what? The idea that there's a, like, a global conspiracy in COVID, like, for what purpose? Oh, yeah, you know what? We're going to shut down commerce and force everyone to sit in their house because that'll make us rich. <laughs> as, as honestly as as these that's 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 when you know that the world like there's a whole swath of the population just, like are just they don't add value um at all and those people are the ones that believe in conspiracy theories like that so that shot's fired i'm sorry if i've lost your listeners but it's the fucking oh, truth no. like dude it's like ridiculous every time i hear one of these you're Glo the, the, the globalist debate this is going to bring countries closer together is it? have you seen any fucking like world treaties or any countries that are working better together post-covid than pre-covid? 
It's just no. like all of those false flag mass shootings that have been used to restrict guns in America. Oh, wait. Oh, oh man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all, like you can't buy a gun at Walmart now, can you, Darren? That's, no. That stopped. You, you can't just go to uh, a parking lot and call it a gun show and avoid background yeah. checks. Uh, it's, it's fucking insane. Like every every time someone makes a statement like that, it just lowers the population's IQ a whole point. It's just as ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's like, and I, I'm so I'm sorry if I'm shattering the myth of what someone thinks is this grand crafted plan, but I'm sorry the world doesn't work that way. And if you think it is, you are enabling the government to have more power than it actually does. Because guess what? Regardless who you vote for pretty shitty when it's in office pretty shitty and pretty ineffectual so yeah that's a thing so all you can do that's why grassroots politics are so important like of finding a candidate locally who actually stands up for the stuff that you believe in and putting your power behind them to try and get them into office because that's how you make change as opposed to just voting arbitrarily between a blue and a red colour, or in my country, a yellow and an orange and a blue and a red colour, uh, or a green colour. That's what you do. You vote for the people that stand up, regardless of po political persuasion, you vote for the people that actually physically stand up for the things that you believe in, and that's how you affect change, rather than the ones that will clearly sell out things to be part of a colour as opposed to a constituent. And I think see second recording, few more drinks, then you get this is the, the conversation at the docks. Then, yeah, yeah that's, that's why we do it like this. I know how we do mm -hmm. things. Uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, I almost wish it's fucked, is what it is. It's fucked there and it's go. ruined, but um, you have to muster through it. I think once you realize, like, I think some people get demoralized and don't vote because it quote unquote doesn't make a difference, always makes a difference. Always on paper, it always makes a difference. I think if you don't vote because you think the system's rigged, you're wrong. The system isn't rigged. The outcome might not be necessarily like in hindsight, four years later, what you wanted, but it's never like, there's always a motivation more on the extremity. There's always a, vote, a, a motivation to vote, and that's why you should nullify that. But at the same time, I think when you have a, a more grounded realisation of how the world works, I think it makes the pill a bit better to swallow. So you don't have to swallow the red pill or the blue pill, right? You just swallow the pill. Um, and that's all it is. Yeah, it's swallowing the pill and just... Yeah. yeah, just a tiny little bit of research makes that pill go down a little bit easier. And just be realistic. Be pragmatic and realistic about your your thoughts uh, overall. It's interesting, like, Enemy of the State as a movie, like I said before, is is very important because it comes, a, I think it's a year before The Matrix. I think The Matrix was 99. He says, unsure. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it was 99. Um, and at that point, that's when conspiracy theory goes full out you imagine this right Jen? like up until the point of enemy of the state the biggest conspiracy theory populated or perp perpetrated on the public is the jfk assassination right yeah it is the big one right like it's, everyone still has an opinion on it so either the cia or the cubans or uh as well i'm a patsy you know what i mean it's back into the left back into the left um so is that is either that like but post 99 uh, or post 98 how many conspiracy theories have you got now oh man speaking of the conspiracy movie uh yeah dude oh, like you, you look at it now got sovereign citizens within, within three years of this movie coming out you have columbine you have uh 9 11 uh, you have the Patriot Act going through, um, and then post then, um, everything, like everything, everything is a conspiracy theory now. Any any event that happens where there's a ma like a mass shooting is a false flag op you know operation, um, or the, the the Bilderberg Group, all that's come to a fucking like full on kind of like spotlight under it it's just like a sea of conspiracy because it's so much easier to think that things are so much more complicated than they actually are 
And that's that's and interestingly enough, that's the genius of enemy of the state. Which by the way, is a whole twenty minutes longer than the conversation. This has a has a twenty minute longer message or does it question mark? Um Gotta but get that's those the, the whole in. got you've got to get out there. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. You know, what I mean, is that is that way that is is prefaced, but it's you know, and it's being someone who kind of enjoys this movie for all its trashiness, it does have a really interesting message behind it. Um, and you just kind of have to, I don't know, kind of have to roll with it, but like when you're playing them back to back, which is kind of what I did last night, um, yeah, it's like comparing a Ferrari with a Skoda. Like <laughs> one is top of the range and the other one is like, yeah, it's fine to drive around in and it'll get me from A to B and everything's okay. And, you know, actually it's pretty good on fuel and all these other things that make it great, but it's not the Ferrari that is parked beside. So, yeah, there you go. I, I highly recommend it. If you've not seen the anime in state in a, a while, it's a ton of fun because it's, it's playing with technology that did not exist at the time that 100% exists now. So uh, their interpretation of it is kind of hilarious. And it's saying, hey, watch out, the NSA might start watching people outside of America like they had already <laughs> been doing. For a while. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> John Voight wouldn't get in that? trouble now. It would just be like, oh, okay. John Voight would be your president now. Ugh. Which is worrying because I know what John Voight's political, political persuasion is and who he would back, and that's worrying. Um, that's the thing, the thing about the whole red-blue divide at the moment, as opposed to being just people, like voting for a person, voting for a party, is that everyone just comes out looking like a dickhead. <laughs> like no one comes out, like no one famous comes out looking clean. And it's, it's bad on both sides. Like anyone sitting there saying that Biden's doing a good job Ooh. is a fucking idiot. But anyone that's sitting there saying Trump would do better is a fucking idiot. You know, and that's why South Park is the greatest show that's ever made because it's shit sandwich or dish bag. All oh, right. Like, and, uh, yeah, and that's the that's literally that's what you're dealing with, and um, they're right. That's what you will all like nowadays. That's what you're dealing with, and that's not going to get any better anytime soon. Sorry for bringing everything down, but that's just where you are, and you just have to grit your teeth, bite the bullet, and get through it. Sometimes you got to ride on the stinky bus or the <laughs> sticky train to get close to where you're trying to go. But there's going to be some walking. <laughs> there's always going to be some walking. Yeah, no! Um, no that's the wrong walking. <laughs> 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 oh, man. I can't, honestly, I genuinely can't thank you enough for inviting me back on. I miss doing this. I don't often get an invite to do anything out with what I do. I, I genuinely think it's because people think he's too busy doing podcast stuff. And I do, I'm busy doing it, but I'm never too busy not to come back and chat with people that I have a fucking huge amount of respect for and a ton of fun recording with. So, um, yeah, this, is, this has been a hit. I'm glad we found the time. I will work on asking you more regularly than every two years. Um. <laughs> Hello, my name's Domino Harvey. If you want to do it, if you, if you book it, I will come. Both right. figuratively and literally, because <laughs> Kieran Knightley, back then anyway, oh my, if you ever want to do a deep dive, and I don't advocate this, Kieran Knightley was a model before she was an actress, and there's plenty of photos of her not wearing anything, really, out there, if you go searching on the internet, and your testicles will not thank me for that, but um, that's all I'll say about that. Just make sure your webcam's off. And also make sure you don't watch the whole which is a great horror movie, but she's fucking 15 in it. And she I'm sure she goes topless in that movie, and that's not cool. Know your limits. <laughs> that's a, a, a that's a PSA if ever there was one. So <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know what we'll be doing next. Uh somewhere not too far down the road. However, we will 
probably, well, I don't know if we'll have time to do it before the summer of teapots. Oh, dude, yeah. <laughs> That's going to be kicking off. Like, you'll be getting emails from me real fucking soon, by the way, because we're doing that early this year to get everything in place. But yeah, uh, podcast under the stairs this year, kind of concluding the six year journey of the top 10 series in the format that it's in is p essentially pitting every year of every decade from the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s and 2010s against the corresponding year to create a definitive list of horror movies which are the best. And there are no winners, there are no losers, there'll be a lot of pain ton of homework and a awkward recording experience that I hope will break every single one of you. If any of you want to record anything after that, I will be surprised. This is how I clear out the competition is by destroying you all. <laughs> so, will yeah, be that'll be. I, I, th there's no way they won't. Like, just the way I've set it up, there's no way that people will be still talking to each other at the end of it, which kind of makes me smile because. I'm not a nice guy. I keep telling everyone they don't believe me, but I'm not a nice guy. So, and this is the this is a definitive proof of how much not of a nice guy I actually am. Um, so yeah, that'll be that'll be swinging its way. Darren, you'll be you'll be joining me before then because I do like shitloads of stuff that you get involved with. But please check out my show podcast under the stairs. Best way to check out everything I do, to be honest, podcast under the stairs and all the other shit is tputscast.com. T p u t s c a s t dot Com. The links to everything are there. Thank you very much for having me on. And uh, yeah, we need to do this more often. I keep saying this. Great conversationalists. That we. <laughs> and you're not my enemy, no matter what state. You're I'm. In. <laughs> it's full circles. Bye, the way, yeah. That's how we do it. Flat circle. <laughs> you're asking too Flat many circle. questions. So that's a different conspiracy show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I blame Matthew McConaughey for the whole flat earth movement. See, if he hadn't said time was a flat circle, would be fine. Oh, have you seen Around the Curve? I have not. You're just giving me shitloads of things to watch now. Let me add this to my list. Around I, the Curve. Pretty sure that's what it's called. It's a documentary about the flat earth movement and the uh, conflicts within. Uh, and I believe it's hinged on they're one of the side stories as a guy that's going to prove mathematically that the Earth is flat, and we'll see how that how that works out. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. My my favorite thing was that guy that built a rocket and died in the <laughs> rocket coming back in <laughs> right. after he realized the Earth was round. Uh, yeah, that's how you do it. It's just a shame he couldn't have built a bigger rocket to put more of those flat earthers in there. Take them out while I was at it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so. If I am incorrect in the title of that documentary, I will correct you. Off thing, you have been Duncan McLeish. I have been Darren. Thank you for coming out from under the stairs and into the bomb shelter. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Never a chore. Boom, boom, psh, boom. Uh, I'm not going to rip off your music. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. I'll speak to you all later. Bye. He did what we all must learn to do. You and you. <laughs>